How's everybody doing today? This is episode one of It's Cobb Talks. Yeah, I know the name sucks, but I'm doing it for the first time. And today I'm joined by the name it's himself, by the man himself, Adam Gilman. Yes, that's correct. How's it there going, sir? Go. And for those on Instagram, his name is at WWE Gelman, and I'll put the uh, link in the description. So tell everyone about yourself, Adam. Um, you know, I've been a card collector for a very long time and um, started off in really collecting team stuff from the Minnesota area where I'm from, Twins and Vikings. And uh, around 2007-ish, uh, started a website uh, called Sports Cards Uncensored that really sort of got me even more engaged on the, the hobby side. So <clears throat> it's been a, a long time. Uh, the, my website's actually older than my kids are now, but um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's something that I've always sort of been active in the hobby and know quite a few of the <clears throat> main players. So really, really fun time overall over the last, you know, probably 20 years um, since I've been, you know, able to support myself as an adult. Um, but I grew up, you know, my dad sort of got, got me into it as a kid. So that's kind of where that all came from. That, that's great. I love hearing from like different collectors, how they got into it. So I just started collecting wrestling cards, like not even a year ago because I've been mm. collecting figures my whole life. So I said, might sure. as well have even more fun with it. Yeah, I hear you. It's a, I didn't actually get into wrestling cards until like 2017. <clears throat> so it's still relatively early compared to sort of where the, where things started really taking off, but you know, my, my son wanted to buy WrestleMania 33 and that's kind of where I got back into wrestling as a kid. I was obsessed, but uh, yeah, from, from here, it's, it's kind of unusual because I never really understood wrestling cards as a hobby um, because I was so engaged with football and basketball. But then in like 2019, I sold off my entire collection of that because it just wasn't fun anymore. It was really driving uh, more anxiety than it was, uh, you know, happiness. So wrestling was something I could do with my family and we all sort of got into it, my wife and my other kids and everybody. So, you know, it's been a good time and the wrestling cards have, you know, exploded over the last few yeah, years. So yeah. that's kind of where, so that's <laughs> kind of an interesting sort of change that has happened more recently. So I think you pretty much answered this already, but do you collect anything besides wrestling cards, like actively? Not actively. No. Um, I used to collect a lot more stuff, um, but you know, I have figures, I have autographs, like, all that stuff I still have, it's because it's all personalized or stuff because I used to meet a lot of different people and meet a lot of sports figures and stuff through my relationships in the hobby and other places. So um, I have a lot of stuff, but not actively collecting anything but, but wrestling at the moment. So you're kind of known as the Becky Lynch collector. Mm -hmm. So anytime somebody pulls some fire on whatnot or anything, your name instantly comes up. <laughs> immediately i know i reached out to i think my buddy john i think his name's like mr jfc or something he pulled a fire becky lynch i think it was from undisputed i said yo you gotta go message him right now yep, he's gonna yep. buy it <laughs> yeah it's i i've really sort of carved out a little uh, slice of heaven here for me in the community which is great because i i really couldn't do the things that I've been able to do with my collection without a lot of the help that I've gotten through Facebook and Instagram, especially on Twitter is it's just, it's, that's the difference between the wrestling card community and really a lot of the other communities is look, you know, there's one or two people that super collect a certain part of wrestling. And you know, those people are the, the ones that everybody goes to whenever they open boxes or see stuff be pulled or whatever. And so that's really cool. Cause it's, it's created like this, situation where nobody is really out for themselves the way that they are in a lot of right. other industries everybody's just trying to help get the super collections going they all have their own super collections that they sort of take back so it's uh, it's inter it's interesting how that's sort of shaped up over the last couple of years where you have a lot more um like kind of investors coming in looking to capitalize on on some of the the value increases where that community aspect has kind of changed a little bit because more people are interested in making money rather than sort of driving at a super collection or a collection of this right. or that. So what made you nail down, I guess, Becky Lynch per se, because my buddy's a Shinsuke oh, yeah. super collector. And the reason he likes him, he just loves Japanese wrestling. Shinsuke came to the States. He's easy to collect because he's in the States. Yeah, that, it's a great question. I get it a lot. So when, when I started liking wrestling back when I was a kid, um, and I grew and I'm old enough to have been right in between the end of like the 
the previous era coming into the attitude era Mm -hmm. so like like my first wrestlemania was like wrestlemania 5 and then i probably stopped watching around like 19 or i'm sorry 2004 maybe Mm -hmm. so like there was like a span of like the attitude era and a few other things and stone cold steve austin was always my favorite wrestler and when we got started watching wrestling again like the the main person that sort of exemplified that badass sort of baby face character was Becky. And so I naturally uh, gravitated towards her because she was, it was awesome to see her do the things that she was doing in the ring. And then the lead up to WrestleMania 35 was probably one of my favorite eras of WWE sort of as a, as that I followed because you had so many awesome things going on and the Becky Lynch story coming out of like, you know, breaking her nose. And the next show after that was actually in Minneapolis. So we got to like see sort of the aftermath of a lot of that. So yeah, it was, it was just like one of those, like just happenstance situations where I came in just as her meteoric rise coming into SummerSlam of uh, 2018 coming all the way through to, you know, her pregnancy a couple of years ago, like those were that was where my sort of wrestling fandom got reignited so it's obviously why why i chose kind of the top baby face character that i gravitated towards based on my likes as a kid well it's like like you said you liked stone cold then you kind of got out of it and you come back and then like a year or two later that you have that becky story which is like if you didn't like becky before everybody loves her now so i can see where you saw that stone cold comparison especially with all that build up going yeah. And I never really stopped like paying attention. Like I right. knew of different things that were going on even when I wasn't watching. Cause you know, you just hear it on Twitter or there's a lot of wrestling collectors in the, that were in the hobby. And I was just sort of passively picking up information. So when 2016, when, when they did the beginning of the women's evolution, like I got a lot of that passively. So it was easy to sort of come through and, um, and understand the importance of the the female superstars, especially in the hobby where, a lot of it is driven by their looks and other uh, right. things that I don't really associate with my collection, but others do. So, you know, the, the, the Alexa bliss collectors. Yeah, exactly. The, <laughs> yeah, the, the thirst traps are, are heavy money traps in, in the hobby. So it's like, it's, it's difficult to sort of get past that. But for me, it was always just gravitating towards that character that I grew up with in stone cold. And, and as she was sort of the modern day representation of that. That, that is insane. Like, it's cool to hear how you, you know, picked her of, of all people, because there's a lot of great people out there, but you singled on her. Do you collect yeah. any, like, Stone Cold stuff? Not nearly as heavily, of course, but... Yeah. Like, any um, modern stuff? I, I've, I've, like, I've... See, like, this is the thing. Like, you when you have a super collection, yep. you own other stuff in a passive fashion. So, yep. I've owned a lot of Stone Cold Steve Austin stuff, and I love picking it up. But I can't keep it because it's valuable enough when I spend money on a Becky card, I have to sell the most expensive parts of my other sort of investment pieces that aren't necessarily directly tied to my PC. And so like, that's the whole problem with this is that I can't have other cards in my collection because they immediately get sold when something big comes up for my main collection. So I, I would love to keep stone cold stuff i just it's too expensive to hold on to when i need to pick up the insanely sure. expensive becky lynch stuff that pops up it's probably like becky lynch is hot and her stuff moves pretty easily but more people know stone cold and there's a absolutely slightly yeah. wider margin for pickup so you can fund your own stuff right so i i gotta know the story of you picking up the one of one and do you have it like on hand with you oh right uh, yeah i do yeah, let me Holy grab it crap <laughs> Yeah. So, um, oh, my lights are going to make this difficult. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, the, here's the thing, like Panini, when Panini took over the WWE license in, um, the beginning of this year around April, uh, well, they took it over on January 1st, but the first product came out around WrestleMania time. And, um, like when they took that over, I, knew well ahead of that that it was coming i had heard because of my connections to people of influence in the hobby like i knew that was coming probably six months ahead of the general public so i knew what that was going to bring along with it given the success of ufc and some of the other launch license launches that they've had and so i started like really figuring out how to exist but i sort of wrote off a lot of the main hits in the product right because 
picking up the top hits in a prism product would far exceed any um, cost of any tops product ever created. Right. It's just, if you want the top cards in those sets, you have to be willing to pay a hundred X in some cases, what you're paying on a top side. It's because of the, the, the way that prism exists outside of wrestling cards it's just it is what it is so i was like okay i'm like i'm out like i can't like and i came to terms with that like i was like okay i'm not going to be able to keep doing this and i was fine with that for a long time because i had about six months to 12 months to really sort of process that the cost of doing business was going to quadruple quintuple whatever it is right yep. and so i like when when the whole release started like it was weird because like it's obviously everybody knows the story. I'm not going to go into it because there's a lot of factors to why what happened happened, but the um, like the top hits like were, I had saved enough in my side collections that I could sell off and get the cards that I felt were the most important ones for me personally, which was the base gold and the autograph gold, right. which are the ones that most of the collectors associate with prism chase. And, and I said to myself, if I can get a color blast too, then I'll get a color blast. Um, the color blast prices were started out much higher than they are right now. Yeah. And the golds were even more expensive. And that's if they've serviced, there's some people where it's only been one or two that have listed been listed. So you really had to make a choice. And, I was able to really sort of like get going much more quickly than I thought I was just be from moving a lot of the other collection I'd invested in. Like I spend uh, probably eight to $900 on Roman Reigns, just knowing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I ended up selling it for like $3,500. So like, that was just, a, that was just an insane increase because I knew exactly what was happening. Same thing with like the rock and stone cold. Like I bought a lot of cheap stuff that, it, the investment cost was probably like 10% of what I eventually got wow. for it in the height of the boom. But I wasn't, I was expecting to hold it longer, but once I was like, you know what, I would rather have the Becky stuff. So I'll just sell all right. this. And I had enough money to pick up almost everything that I wanted within the, the, within prism. What didn't, what I, what I automatically assumed was going to be out of my price range from day one was the black, which if you saw what some of them are selling for and even to this day are still selling for like it's for a lot of people, it's just out of their price range. And I sure. was one of those people, but I was able to work some stuff to, you know, to what at the time, what I thought was close and then it sold for $10,000. And I was like, okay, this is not going to be my card. <laughs> so I kept in touch with the guy that bought it. And, um, you know, I was like, there's no way I can pay five figures for a Becky card. I just can't. It's just not worth it. It's just, it's not going to be there. So over time, he and I kept talking and kept talking and I kept trying to like work some sort of deal. And he was awesome to work with. And then like, you know, the, as the market started to like con continually go down across the entirety of the hobby. And I said, when this started that WWE and the fringe mainstream stuff would be the first to really tank. Like that's exactly what happened. And um, so all of a sudden this $10,000 card started like coming to his offers started like coming down further and further and further in value. And I'm like, well, crap, I might <laughs> actually have a play at this. <laughs> so um, I got some help in, in from another Becky collector who took some of my printing plates and stuff like that, that, you know, I, I collected because like um, in wrestling cards, like the one of one designation is the all important thing for wrestling cards. Right. And he just, and he, as he, as a, as a guy who has a better Becky collection than I do, it's more, mostly more older stuff, but his he has like anything from like 2017 and before, like all that stuff is his, like anything 2017 and after is mine. Really? So like, yeah, it's crazy. He has an insane collection. And, oh, not, it's not just Becky he has an insane wrestling card collection. He's probably one of the most valuable wrestling card collectors in the, in the entire world. Yeah. And so he has a bunch of stuff and um, he, he was like, okay, I'll buy some of the, I'll buy these printing plates and then you go and buy the card that you want. Cause I've always chased like the shiny stuff. He's right. more of like the existing tops products. I focus on Chrome. I focus on the things that are high end. He's much more in the other direction. So right. I think, and he's amassed just in a, an insane collection. So he funded, um, you know, with the cards that I sold him, which to me were valuable and, and I would have loved to keep, but I had to make a choice, right? I can't exactly. have both. So I chose the black. And when it was sold on the floor of the NSCC um, that just got done in, in Atlantic City, 
um, it was one of those things where I was like, okay, and it's now or never. So I contacted the guy who bought it on the floor and I was like, listen, you gave cash and trade for this. I'll give you all cash. And you just walk into the sunset and never have to think about this again. And he was like, okay, let's do it. So then it worked out. And as it stands right now, I'm one card away from the rainbow, which I never thought would be a possibility, but what here we are. are missing? The gold shimmer out of three. Oh, dude. So that's going to be a tough one. I like none of those have really even like surfaced of anybody. I've got I've got a lead on one, but the it's in pot. He's like he's not responding, and it's tough to get. So yeah, oh. that one's probably out of hand, out of sight for until it pops up, and then I've got to fight off all the other people who are really going to jump all over to missing their rainbows. But they ain't going to get the full rainbow anymore. So no. Also though, like you and that other Becky Lynch collector, it's cool that y'all have like a cutoff. So like if you obtain a grail per se of like pre 2017 you know you probably have a buyer and he might in turn like you said like the collectors look out for each other a lot he could hook you up down the road that's probably not why you're doing yeah. it but you know we, we i mean we we talk all the time and like we compete with each other and like we've driven like if you look at the the high high end like super rare becky lynch stuff like it is miles ahead of anything else that exists within the Becky Lynch world. Like we fight each other over all of these things. Um, and like he, he's, you know, and I have, I mean, we, we generally have an understanding, like there are things that I've chased harder. I'm much better at digging through and I get a lot more notifications because I'm more connected. So he tends to like bide his time. He's much more patient. I am not. And so it's, it's, it's worked out well. And, you know, all of those things have, have been great. And we've, we have a friendly rivalry, but yeah, I mean, like we, we try and make sure that if there is something rare that gets posted, it's between the two of us. So we at least know that somebody who has a main Becky Lynch collection is going to own the, the best pieces. And so far, that's absolutely what's happened. I have, he's gotten a few of the, of the stuff that from more recent times, just because I, again, like it's, it's, I can't keep everything if I'm going to buy cards like this. So like he's gotten like the cards that I sold him to, to fund this were, um, you know, not the ones that I was hoping to sell, but it's part of the decision of quantity over quality. And I chose right. quality in this case. Well, at the end of the day though, if you decide you want those more than he does, you know where to go and get them. It's not like just putting on eBay, whoever gets it, gets it. Yeah. So besides the one of one, obviously, what was your hardest card to get of the rainbow besides the shimmer? They were all pretty easy. I mean, really? like the, the yeah, Prism was one of those sets where everybody was selling. So like the top stuff, people hold it, and that's where it's yeah. difficult. Like the Prism stuff was easy. I'm there, there's very rare thing was that a difficult find for any of the cards. I got the, there's only been one base gold posted that I've seen. I know where another one is, but it hasn't been posted. Um, so like that was probably the hardest one just to get the, the one out of 10, which is the one that everybody wants, but it, it would, and it was expensive. So, so you have really the one time. out of 10 gold. No, I think it's seven out of 10. Oh, at the end of the day, though, it's still gold Becky Lynch. So yeah. my personal favorites of the prism rainbows have been like the scope cards. Yes. Which mm -hmm. I forgot how they were distributed. And the premium the box set. Yeah. Oh, yeah the yeah, premium yeah. they they sold a premium box set those scope ones are going to be impossible to find i'm just letting everybody know like there were maybe four of those sets that were opened if that and the rest of them are sitting somewhere i have like panini couldn't sell them they they priced it exceptionally high and no one bought it so i uh those are probably my favorites to collect and speaking of those i got the scopes of the people ipc and then i was going for tiffany stratton because that's somebody i'm really high on and somebody had it mm -hmm. for like eight hundred dollars and i was like that's not happening anytime soon <laughs> but like what yeah. is your favorite i guess a couple parallels of just visually looking at uh the green pulsar is by far the best looking one in the entire set i think that's not a, even that's a, a slept on one because it's a black not even a question exclusive. yeah it's not really? well yeah it's like oh well, it is it is in a retail exclusive but it's the best looking parallel they've made in this set it's not even close i got a couple discussion. graded through the csg submission and this isn't one of the pulsars obviously but like this is a gold jc jane auto i pulled but the green pulsars look so good in a slab i didn't i i don't i'm not a grading fan like i i don't grade anything even though the color blasts i have are graded and um and the black is obviously great i wasn't the one that did that i just right. bought them like that they're too expensive to, to risk cracking out of those cases nor yeah 
would it be a good idea? But yeah, the pulsar I had to get like through like some like you said, somebody reached out to me and say, Hey, I pulled this. Do you want it? And I'm like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I actually have the champion pulsar and autograph and the base pulsar, which I got both through those types of community outsourcing. And it was it's awesome. Like they're my favorite cards of that entire run is those green pulsars look amazing. They look like they're out of the matrix, and that's it's just yeah, my favorite. Do. But and- the only reason I got these graded is because I got, I got them graded for fifteen dollars a pop in a group uh, group submission. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, nope. I just, I I've never got into that, so it's never been something I've even considered. So I know you and I talked before, and you have another rare piece in your collection, and that is a ring worn jacket. Which event I is do. that from? Yeah, uh, she wore it on TV in twenty nineteen on SmackDown, I believe, and um, I think she only wore it a couple of times. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I know the person who painted them. So one of us, I got two of them. Um, yeah, I got two of them. I have one that she wore like during the house show loops, uh, in 2018 and 2019, as she was leading up to the triple thread WrestleMania, that one, um, I, the only reason I was able to get these is because tops was originally going to cut them up and put them in fully loaded or, or other sets. And so they, they were able to get one cut up and put into fully loaded. That's the set in 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one is from those, that house show loop. I was, I re- got the other one and uh, kept that one. So that one is now framed on my wall. You have to send me a picture so I can like put it up in here when I'm editing. Yeah, I can, I'll see if I can get, I mean, it's like, it's yeah. Oh my God. I can't get my webcam to work. Huh? Yeah, so. <laughs> that is that is absolutely beautiful. Well, I know you got a meeting coming up, so yeah. I appreciate you doing this. Anything you want to plug or say before we sign off here? No, man. Good luck with this. I know it's uh, it's hard to get these things up and running. If I had any sort of time whatsoever, I would do my own, but I'm glad that uh, you've gotten a chance to do this. Con- con- congratulations, and you know, hopefully you get going on this. All right, man. Well, thanks. Well, guys, that's it for episode one of It's Cop Talks. Let me know who you want me to interview down below in the comments. I got a couple people in mind, but as always, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and last but not least, take it easy. Thanks. Thanks.